So over Hawaii, where they, we relit the S-4B, and it was, an, it was a very unusual sensation. Uh, you've all been in airliners and been in fighters. When you look back, you can see the, the airfield getting smaller, the buildings getting smaller. This time, the whole damn earth was getting smaller. <laughs> and we, we accelerated up to 25,000 miles an hour, and uh, it was a remarkable, a remarkable feeling. It, it was. I remember Lovell saying, gosh, I can see the end of Chile, and I can see England all at the same time. Well, pretty soon you could see the whole Earth as a disk. We went out and undid ourselves from the rocket and turned around and found out that it would be very easy to, to dock uh, w with the limb if we'd had a limb. And we started on our way to the, to the moon. Then about two hours later, uh, I got sick. Uh, I had flown, as you know, I told you, two weeks in Gemini. And I, I didn't know what was wrong, but I started uh, getting nauseous and I threw up to the great consternation of Lovell and Anders, who won't let me forget it to this day because it's a very close space. And you know, when you vomit in zero G, it doesn't go down, it goes everywhere. <laughs> so they were trying to catch it and sop it up. <laughs> and, and I didn't care. So I suspect, I thought perhaps it was because I'd taken a sleeping pill. I don't normally take those things, but I, I suspect it may have been the case of, uh, of uh, uh, motion sickness or what zero G sickness because we could move around a lot more. But in any event, in about a half an hour, I was fine. And I didn't want to, I didn't mention that to anybody on the ground, but Anders was a very disciplined guy. Anders was a wonderful guy. And he said, well, we got to let him know on the ground. I said, what for? I'm all well. He said, well, I'll tell you what. He said, I'll put it on the tape and dump it. And then, and so he put on the tape and dumped it and nobody read it, which was fine with me until about eight or nine hours later, finally they read it, and then they all hell broke loose because every doctor, every doctor in the world wanted to know if I had cholera or whatever. <laughs> that was the one element of NASA that was a little funny, the doctor. <laughs> but I got over it quickly, and things went well, and we flew for two and a half days, really without ever seeing the moon. Lovell found that he could navigate extremely well. We depended for our primary source of navigation on the S-band radar, but he had an inertial, an inertial platform on board that we used celestial navigation with, and Lovell got to be really good with it. And that's an interesting story. The inertial platform was, was powered by gyros. It was made by MIT, Dr. Stark Draper's laboratory. And this thing was a really remarkable. Well, it was uh, evolved from the Polaris uh, platform. So the, the idea was that in order to save power, you would only turn these gyros on when you wanted to take a sighting. Well, you know, I'd been around aviation for a long time, and I always figured if you got something running, leave it alone. So I wrote a long letter to NASA management, and I said, look, I'd just as soon leave this platform run. We have the energy. It isn't going to be that big a deal. Let's let it run. So NASA forwarded to MIT. And back came a letter from the guy that was responsible for designing the, the platform. And he gave two pages of reasons why that thing was designed to be turned off. And he signed his name. And at the, this is a true story. At the bottom, he put, P.S., if I was on this mission, I'd let the damn thing run too. <laughs> So the platform ran full time on every, on every Apollo mission, even though one designed that one. So we flew for two and a half days, and, uh, and we really never saw the moon. It was just a sliver. And, and, and then the time came, you turn around upside down and backwards because you were going to go around the back of the moon if everybody had configured everything properly. And then we were going to fire our, our service propulsion mo module engine behind the moon to slow us up so we'd be captured by the, uh, the lunar gravity. And this was an exciting time because you couldn't see anything. Uh, and, and we were supposed to come within 60 miles of the back of the moon on our own. And then we would shoot the end or fire the engine, and that would slow us up so we were on a trajectory 60 by 180 miles. But you know, we'd come 240,000 miles. And you didn't have to be very far off to be 61 miles low, which <laughs> which would have been a very sudden stop. So, so one, of the, uh, 
one of the uh, parameters that I was very aware of, I told Anders, I said, look, one of the things we know is that when we get behind that moon, just partially, the radio transmission with the Earth is going to be off, right? So we, on our flight plan, we knew what time that should be. And that would give us a first indication whether we were going to hit the moon or not. And I was interested in that. I really was. <laughs> so lo and behold, as we go behind the moon, at the exact millisecond that we're supposed to lose radio co communication, we lost it. And I said, boy, I, said, I told Landers, I said, we must be right on track. Boy, those guys are wonderful. And he said, they probably just shut the goddamn radio off. <laughs> He was a sailor, he was cynical, but, it, but, they, <laughs> but they didn't. It was remarkable. You stop to think about it. First time out, 240,000 miles, right on the trajectory, a trajectory that was planned by people whose average age was 28. 